I'm just going to say hi, and then I'm going to mute myself. Okay, sounds Let great. Me take over. Uh, there's another. We just had a bunch of people register. I'm thinking we're going to have a few more join us. That's great. Hello. Hi, welcome. We're just gathering everybody. We'll wait for a couple more minutes before we get started. Okay, so Stacy and Ellie tell me we're live on Facebook. So um, that is awesome. People will be able to watch and follow. So um, I'm um, Sita. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to let you take off. I'm going to mute myself and go away. And um, we're so excited to have Barbara join us. So thank you. Well, my pleasure. Thanks, Mary Kay. And welcome, everybody. This is the first of three Leadership Summer Summit sessions. Normally, we all gather together the first Saturday in November, but this is the pandemic. So here we are, we're spreading it out over three sessions and I'm seated deal. I'm a NAMI Wisconsin board member. I also belong to NAMI Dane County here in Madison. And I chair the public policy and advocacy committee for NAMI Wisconsin. I'm a longtime NAMI member myself and I've worked at the state and the national level for the NAMI staff. And I care deeply about public policy and about voting. So this is absolutely right up my alley. So the focus of the October summit series is vote for mental health. And particularly we're gonna focus in on the disability vote coalition and uh, voting when you have a disability. And we thank you all for taking the time to come today and to learn about this very timely, very important topic. A few quick things just before we get started. We're gonna have two presenters today, and then we'll have time at the end of each for Q&A. Your questions can be answer answered in the chat, chat box, which if you go down to the bottom of your screen, that's that little cartoon speech bubble, and then it'll come up on the side in the white, uh, in a white panel on the side. And then, um, so you can enter those questions at any time. On, during the webinar, and then there are going to be evaluations for you at the end of the webinar. So please take a quick minute. It really won't take long to answer these questions. It's really important because we're always trying to we'll do our best to help you succeed. So um, just help us understand that we can do what we can do better for future events. And I also want to thank all of our talented presenters who dedicate their time and their energy to be with us today. I know what it takes to pull all of this kind of information together, even if you know it well, and I deeply appreciate the time you're taking to do this. So first up, we're going to have Barbara Becker join us from Disability Rights Wisconsin. Barbara is the director of the Milwaukee Office of Disability Rights Wisconsin, or DRW, and she's also the director of external advocacy for Southern Wisconsin. She coordinates DRW's protection and advocacy voting access project, which is they, they have voting access projects in each and every state. It's something that was passed by Congress a long time ago uh, to support voters with disabilities to fully participate in the electoral process. So it's not political, it's voting, you know, it's so that you could vote no matter what your perspective is. Barbara coordinates the Wisconsin Disability Vote Coalition in, participant, in partnership with the Wisconsin Board for People with Developmental Disabilities. And she also coordinates the Milwaukee Mental Health Task Force. 
and uh, she staffed at DRW's Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness Advisory Council, which provides community input for DRW's mental health advocacy. So DRW, Disability Rights Wisconsin, is the federally authorized protection and advocacy agency for Wisconsinites with disabilities, all kinds of disabilities. Uh, part of a national network of agencies mandated by Congress to protect and advocate for the legal and human rights of children and adults with disabilities, including mental illness. Barbara works to advance the rights of people with disabilities to live as independently as possible and to be free of abuse and neglect and discrimination. So Barbara, please tell us about our right to vote. There you are, welcome. And I think Barbara's gonna share her screen. She's gonna share some yes. slides if Zoom will cooperate. All right, are we screen sharing, Sita? Yes, you, you are. you see the PowerPoint? Yep, we're all good. All right, wonderful, I'm just gonna put it into slide view. So um, thank you so much for the invitation and it's wonderful to be here with um, such a, a valued partner. NAMI Wisconsin is um, an organization that I have the pleasure and privilege of working with on a wide range of mental health advocacy issues as well as uh, in our voting coalition and um, your, your staff do a great job and CETA as well as a wonderful partner. So great to be here with all of you today. Uh, such a timely uh, presentation because today is the first day of in-person or early voting in Wisconsin. Uh, so wanted to start out by telling you just a little bit about the Disability Vote Coalition. It's a nonpartisan effort to help ensure full participation in the electoral process for voters with disabilities. And we have a wide range of organizations who are part of the coalition, including NAMI Wisconsin and NAMI Dane County. Uh, the coalition's coordinated by DRW and the Wisconsin BPDD as Sita mentioned. And we would love to have any of the affiliates join us. Um, we generally meet once a month and share a lot of information and provide a lot of resources. And um, you're all welcome to access the resources. Uh, our website is disabilityvote.org. We have a Facebook page um, that's very active. We'd love to have you like and share the resources, have fact sheets and videos, and those are all available for you to use with your affiliates. In addition, uh, the DRW Voter Hotline is available to answer voting questions. And that's available all year round, not just at election time or election day, 844-DIS-VOTE. And I've also provided the email address here. Sometimes that's a quicker way to get through. Uh, and uh, we do have a, a Zoom Lunch and Learn this Thursday on voter rights. So if you're eager to learn more, um, join us on Thursday. You can register on our website. So. Today, we're going to go through a lot of the basics, um, kind of A to Z uh, on voting, and we'll also have time for some questions. So I look forward to hearing from you uh, about any concerns that you may have, and feel free to follow up after the training as well. So we encourage um, all of you and uh, any community members who you may help to support, if you have not done so already, make your voting plan now. Do not delay. Um, Voters with mental illness and other disabilities um, historically may experience barriers to voting. And this year, we found that um, the number of voters experiencing barriers is quite high because of the pandemic and the unique situation that we're all in right now. So um, we've already are beyond the date for voters to register online or by mail. Here are some of the key dates for the remainder of this election cycle. Today, October 20th, is the first day that clerks can offer in-person absentee voting in their office or other locations that they designate. 
and October 30th is the final day to register to vote at your municipal clerk's office or satellite location. So folks can still register to vote ahead of November 3rd, but not by mail or online. In terms of requesting an absentee ballot, we're seeing uh, historical highs in terms of use of absentee voting this year. So um, although legally the deadline is October 29th, if someone requested an absentee ballot online on October 29th, they would not have it on time. So we're really recommending that folks request their absentee ballot, if possible, by today, October 20th, to allow time for it to be mailed to them to complete it and to return it. The deadline to return that absentee ballot is November 3rd, election day by 8 p.m. And uh, election day uh, on November 3rd, the polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. So uh, let's start at the beginning and talk a little about voter eligibility. In Wisconsin, you're eligible to vote if you're a U.S. citizen, at least 18, on or before election day, you've resided in Wisconsin for 28 days prior to the election. That's a recent change in the law as a result of litigation. It used to be 10 days. You are not currently serving a sentence for a felony conviction, including incarceration, parole, probation, or extended supervision. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. That's a priority area for us because unfortunately, um, people with mental illness are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. And finally, if you have not been determined by a court to be ineligible to vote, for example, through a guardianship decision, and I'll talk a little more about that as well. Voter registration. So who needs to register? If someone is a first time voter, they need to register. If they've moved, you need to re-register if you've changed your name, or if you haven't voted in four years. And often people are a little unsure about their registration status. So we recommend that people check that out. And uh, you can assist if you're helping others with voting, you can assist them if they don't have access to a computer to look online at the My Vote Wisconsin website. Um, at this point in time, as I said, people can no longer register to vote online. The deadline was October 14th, but they can still check the status of their information. Uh, people then could go to register in person at their municipal clerk's office, or depending where you live, there may be other locations. And Wisconsin is a state that does allow people to register at their polling place on election day, which is a good thing. That's not the case in all states. So as I mentioned, we encourage everyone to check and see, are you registered to vote? Is your voting address and uh, name, are those current uh, in the My Vote system? If you're not registered to vote, uh, again, the option's too late now for online or mail, but you can do it in person or on your polling place on election day. And for that, you need to provide proof of residence and photo ID. And I'll explain a little what that means. So um, proof of uh, residence, that can be a variety of documents. So first of all, if you have a state of Wisconsin driver's license or ID card that have your current address on them, those can serve as a proof of residence document. Uh, uh, other documents that might qualify, sometimes people have moved and their driver's license isn't current. So it, do, it doesn't qualify as proof of residence, but you can use a current utility bill, a lease, a paycheck or pay stub, a university ID card or other official document showing the voter's name and address. We do um, a lot of support for voters who may be living in a group home or a nursing home. Uh, in that case, uh, we recommend that they use an intake document or a contract that has the address of the facility on it. Uh, the room number is not required. And that's important because if someone is living at a group home, for example, 
they aren't getting a utility bill with the address on it, they may not have uh, something to easily show proof of residence. So that intake document is important. Okay, requesting an absentee ballot. As I said, this has been something that uh, has been heavily utilized in Wisconsin this year because of the pandemic. So um, an option that is easy for a lot of people, but not for everyone, is if you have online access to go to the My Vote Wisconsin website, you can see what the address is here, and uh, request an absentee ballot. If you have not recently requested an absentee ballot, you'll need to upload a photo ID the first time you do it. So when I requested my absentee ballot earlier this year, I took a picture with my smartphone uh, of my driver's license and I uploaded it to the website. We found that for a lot of people, they may not have easy access to the technology or it may not be easy for them to do this. So. Um, there are different ways to request that absentee ballot. Uh, you can use the paper form uh, and you can send that in along with a photocopy of your photo ID, or you can send it by email. That too would require having a electronic copy of your photo ID or in person at your clerk's office. I wanna to recommend to everyone, if you don't currently know who your municipal clerk is, that's a really important contact to um, overseas elections in your community and can be very helpful. So um, find out who they are and save their contact information so you have it for future reference. That's another thing that you can look up on the My Vote Wisconsin website. We often hear from voters with a disability, a lot of voters with disabilities, including people with a mental health diagnosis are non-drivers. So they don't have um, a driver's license. So that whole issue of having a photo ID is sometimes a barrier. So in some cases, um, a voter may be able to exempt themselves from the photo ID requirement if they consider themselves to be what is called an indefinitely confined voter. That term is often confusing uh, for people, but what it means is that um, the voter needs to vote absentee due to disability, age, illness, or infirmity. We've talked a lot about this with the Wisconsin Election Commission, and what they've said is that's a designation that each voter can make based upon their current circumstances. It doesn't require permanent or total inability to travel outside of the residence. And there is not a requirement to provide a note from your doctor or some other kind of um, documentation. So for example, I know I've talked before to a voter who has a mental health disability that causes them to have tr tremendous anxiety about leaving their home, uh, agoraphobia. So a voter like that might choose to designate themselves as an indefinitely confined voter. That means that they'll automatically for this election and future elections have an absentee ballot mailed to them. So they'll always get that absentee ballot and there is not a requirement to provide a photo ID. Uh, if anyone has questions about this, I'm happy to talk with you offline. But in terms of the requirement, there's a section both on the My Vote, if you're applying online, or on the paper form, it's on section six, where you choose that option that you're indefinitely confined. Or you can send a request in writing to your municipal clerk. Uh, again, for voters who live in a group home, I know some counties um, have a lot of placement of people with a mental illness in group homes. So this might be something that you hear about from community members. Again, in those cases, the resident can certify they're indefinitely confined and be exempt from providing that photo ID. The absentee ballot. Um, again, we have such high usage of this and a lot of people aren't familiar with it. So we encourage people carefully follow the instructions uh, included with that absentee ballot. 
You really need to follow every step correctly or your vote may not be counted. Use a pen to complete the ballot. And if you change your mind or think you made a mistake, contact your clerk. It's kind of a recurring theme in uh, our comments today. Uh, if you have made a mistake, your ballot may be considered spoiled and you can request a replacement ballot. Wisconsin has a requirement with absentee voting that your ballot must be witnessed by an adult US citizen who isn't an election candidate. The purpose of the witness is that they're just verifying that the person who completed the ballot is the person who it was issued to. They're not supposed to see what you wrote on the ballot, um, just to confirm that you completed it. Your witness can be a friend, it can be a spouse, a neighbor, a family member, a care worker. So for example, if, if someone is in a CSP program, they could have their CSP worker be their witness. We have heard a lot this year because it's such an unusual time and people are isolating because of the pandemic. So people who live alone are sometimes worried, you know, they don't have someone who they live with who can be their witness. For me, I, I had my husband be my witness and he was, uh, and I was his witness. But other people who live alone, this is a real dilemma for. So um, if you get those comments or questions, again, uh, there's a wide range of people who can serve in this role. Some communities have a drop-off location for absentee ballots and may have staff to witness your ballot. They do that in Madison, for example. So ask your clerk. Um, if you are quarantining, in that case, a family member, a friend or neighbor can watch you vote through a window. Uh, you can put the ballot in the envelope, seal it and leave it outside the door for the witness to sign. If you're still stumped and don't have a, a witness, you might ask your local aging and disability resource center. Some of them are able to help with finding a witness. And you can also contact your clerk. So those are some you know, strategies if someone's having difficulty. I know here in Milwaukee, um, we've had a few calls through our voter hotline and there is a community agency that has volunteers who are willing to go out um, to assist older adults and people with disabilities and serve as a witness. So depending where you live, there might be some community volunteers. So what does a witness do? Verify you completed the absentee ballot, but not tell you who to vote for or actually see the ballot. This is a picture of the envelope. So um, you as a voter need to sign your name and date it. The witness needs to sign their name and very important, they need to provide their complete address. If any of those things are missing, then your ballot is not complete and, and would not count unless that is fixed. We all often hear too from people who, because of their disability, may have difficulty completing their ballot. And that can be for a lot of different reasons. Someone who's blind, who has a physical disability, someone who may not be comfortable with reading and writing, but they know who they wanna vote for. So a voter can ask for assistance from anyone who is not their employer or a representative of their labor union. Uh, explaining just how to fill out your ballot or return envelope, that's, that's not considered assistance. So if you and I had a conversation about how to fill out your ballot, that wouldn't be considered assistance. But if they're actually helping them with completing it, then the assistant must sign in a area on the ballot called the certification, certification of voter assistance. They can read the ballot to you, they can fill it out under your direction, but cannot tell you how to vote. If someone signs the ballot, uh, the absentee ballot on your, on your behalf, they also need to sign the certification of assistance section on the envelope. And the assistant can also serve as a witness. Had a lot of questions about that this year too. Again, if someone is in a care facility, in a group home, for example, staff can assist them if the voter requested. Again, staff cannot tell the person who to vote for. 
they can only follow their direction. We've got some tips on that here. So as I mentioned before, um, you know, from time to time, people may make a mistake while marking their ballot and be worried about that. So the good news is that if the timing is right, you can get a replacement ballot, but you need to contact your clerk as soon as possible um, because that ballot would then be considered spoiled and you can have another ballot issued. The key is whether the deadline for requesting an absentee ballot has passed. And if there isn't enough time to request a replacement ballot and you haven't returned it, you can still vote in person, either at the polls on election day or for early voting. The deadline for returning the absentee ballot is technically it's 8 p.m. on election day. But again, we encourage people to act as soon as possible. Um, the USPS uh, recommends a minimum of a week before election day to arrive in time. A lot of people are nervous right now about relying on the post office. Um, so some other options are to drop off your ballot in an absentee ballot drop box or at your clerk's office. Um, over the weekend, um, Ed and I walked over to an absentee drop box, uh, you know, in the community where we live and we dropped off our ballots. So most communities have some type of absentee uh, drop box, but you need to check with your clerk on the location. If it's actually election day and you're dropping off your absentee ballot at that time, again, you're gonna have to check with your clerk because in some communities, you can drop it off at your polling place, but that's not the case everywhere. Um, a number of Wisconsin communities, I think it's 40, have what's called central count. Milwaukee does that, Green Bay does that. Then all the absentee ballots are counted at one location. So in those communities, people cannot return their absentee ballot at their polling place. One important piece of guidance you can ask someone else to deliver your ballot for you. So again, a lot of the people who we provide guidance to, they are non-drivers. So they may not, not be able to drive to a drop box or drive to a polling place to return that ballot. They can ask a neighbor, a friend, a care worker, a person of their choice who they trust to deliver the ballot. Uh, You've heard me talk a lot about the My Vote Wisconsin website. It really has a lot of great information and it's recently been enhanced to add what they're calling in-person absentee options. So that includes early voting location and absentee ballot drop box options. So if you go to My Vote, you wanna find the local absentee options uh, for you, personalized for you and that'll tell you where the list of drop boxes, as long as your clerk has entered that information. And if they haven't, you could encourage them to do so. This is also um, a new, uh, an expanded feature in my vote. So a lot of people, if they're voting absentee, they feel nervous, you know, how do I know that they got my request? When am I gonna receive my ballot? And um, have they received uh, and counted my ballot at the polling place. So this screen, uh, the tracking screen will give you that information. So this was for the June election. So I made my request on June 15th. It was approved then. It was sent to me on the 26th. They told me the anticipated delivery. And then once my ballot was received, it would be updated on my vote. So. If you are working with voters or checking your own status, this is an important screen. Please check it out. If you see an orange box, it means there's a problem. Possibly there was an issue that a signature was missing uh, or photo ID or the witness information. If you have an orange box, you have a chance to fix that and make sure your vote is counted. Very important. So check for the status on my vote and contact your clerk. And again, a reminder, if you requested an absentee ballot, 
you don't get it in time, you can still vote in person on election day or vote early at your clerk's office. So that early voting, you've heard me mention a few times that started today or it is allowed to start today. Wisconsin is the most decentralized voting system in the country. Um, we have, I think it's 1850 municipalities and they have a lot of um, autonomy and control over how they run voting. And each of them does it, I think a little bit differently. So they can begin early voting uh, today on the 20th. They are not required to do that. And early voting can go through the Sunday before election day, which is November 1st. So check with your community if you're interested in early voting and find out what the hours are and what days it's available. And one of the good things to know about this is during COVID, um, the expectation is that early voting will not be as crowded as um, November 3rd, election day, so it can be safer time to vote. Now I have to say that there are a number of communities today that have long lines of people waiting for early voting, but it's a first day. Um, maybe by the end of the week that will slow down and it won't be as, as crowded. And you know it differs a lot from urban areas to rural areas. So it depends where you live. Photo ID. Uh, we talked a little bit about that earlier when uh, voting Wisconsin does require that you provide that photo ID unless you're exempt by law. Uh, we find that you know there are some voters with disabilities, including mental illness, who just due to the nature of some of the challenges they've had in their life that they may not have a photo ID for voting. The good news is that a free photo ID is available from the Department of Motor Vehicles. And we really encourage people to check that out get that photo ID. Uh, here's the number for the DMV voter ID hotline. Plan ahead, call first because again, because of COVID, a lot of the hours at DMV locations have changed. And even if people do not have all of the documents that they suggest you bring, for example, if someone doesn't have a birth certificate, they can still get a provisional 60 day ID that can be used for voting and DMV will help them to get their birth certificate. So encourage folks to go. For any of you who are in Madison, um, Disability Rights Wisconsin and the Disability Vote Coalition had advocated for additional DMV locations and expanded hours. And we made a little bit of progress, had a little bit of an advocacy win. And there is a new location in Madison on the south side. And We'd like to make that permanent, but for that to happen, they need to see high utilization. So we hope you'll help us to get the word out about that. Here's a, just a visual of the most common photo IDs. We have a lot of voting materials. And if any of you are sharing resources, we have copies of these and would be happy to send them out to you. So for those who are voting in person, a few tips on staying safe. Plan ahead. If you look on my vote, you can see what will be on your ballot. So you go in knowing who you want to vote for. Curbside voting, I'll talk more about that in a minute, but that's an option where you can vote without entering your polling place. You can stay outside. Check your polling place before you go. This year, more than any other year that I can recall, there have been a lot of changes in polling places. So make sure you don't go to the wrong place. If you have to get out of your car to vote, practice social distancing, wash your hands and wear a mask and be patient. This is really a tough time for election workers, a lot of new poll workers who are not experienced. Bring your own black pen. And just a reminder, voters are not allowed to wear anything with partisan information or candidate names. Curbside voting is required by law for voters who cannot enter the polling place due to disability. Uh, during this year, the Election Commission has said that individuals who are immunocompromised or have symptoms of COVID-19 are eligible to curbside vote. Uh, 
Although curbside voting is supposed to be available at every polling place, often people aren't aware of this. So we appreciate your help getting the word out. It's also supposed to be available during early voting. Again, we encourage people contact your municipal clerk. There may be a particular entrance that you're supposed to drive up by or a parking lot. Um, you may be supposed to honk your horn or ring a doorbell, um, but ask and make a plan in advance. Can I still vote if I have a guardian? Well, that depends. In Wisconsin, a person under guardianship retains the right to vote unless the court expressly removes it. So we've got some tips and it has some brochures as well that talk about how people can determine this. There's a form uh, that provides that information. If someone has lost the right to vote, that box is checked on the form. So people can either request the form or contact their clerk the clerk gets a list from the state of people who have been found incompetent and ineligible to vote. And if someone is under guardianship and has lost that right to vote and they want to get it restored, Disability Rights Wisconsin has um, some guidance and support that we can provide to them to assist them with that process. So send them our way, please. Can I still vote if I was convicted of a misdemeanor or felony. So this is an area with a lot of confusion. Again, a lot impacts a lot of people with mental illness. So people do not <coughs> lose their right to vote if convicted of a misdemeanor. If someone's been convicted of a felony, they can vote after they finish their sentence and are off paper, meaning completed probation, parole, and extended supervision. We've been doing some work with the Department of Corrections and the Election Commission to improve the communication about that. Until just a few weeks ago, it would still show on my vote, it would say felon, regardless of whether someone was off paper or not. That's no longer the case that's been removed. And the Department of Correction is doing some work to um, provide more education for people about the restoration of their voting rights. ACLU Wisconsin has some really good resource materials. So this is an area of interest for you. Check that out. Uh, is there a requirement to wear face coverings while voting? Um, it is recommended. Poll workers are supposed to be required to wear them and election officials but we did get some complaints um, during the last election. And unfortunately, it's up to the municipalities to enforce that. Barbara, you've got about three or four more minutes. Wonderful. Thank you for that reminder, Sita. So um, I provided the NAMI team here with a few follow-up uh, materials in addition to the PowerPoint, a few of our fact sheets. And we have a new fact sheet that is about voter rights. So I hope that maybe that can be shared with uh, the folks who are on the webinar today as a follow-up. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna go through each of the rights now, but um, that would be something that you could look at after the fact. Uh, and if you have any question about voting rights, please contact us at the DRW voter hotline. I think the main message is that a, a voter with a disability has the right to ask for reasonable accommodations at the polling place, whatever those might be. And check out the, our new fact sheet for more detail. So, um, we're an agency that people contact because they have a problem. So most voters don't have a problem, but we try and anticipate and give people some tips about what to do if they have a problem. So first contact the election inspector at your polling place or ask for the clerk. If it doesn't get resolved, report the concern to the elections commission uh, there is an option on their website. We really encourage people, if you have a concern, even if it gets resolved, it's helpful to report it because that can make a difference for the future and for other voters. And contact us at 844-DISVOTE or info at disabilityvote.org and we'll provide you with assistance. We also have some resources to help you be an informed voter 
the vote411.org site uh, provides a lot of information, nonpartisan information about candidates. We've got some questions for candidates that we hope you'll use and sign. And we hope that you will follow us um, on Facebook and sign up for our e-newsletter. We'd love to keep you informed. Uh, so I will wrap it up now. We've got you know, some additional information in the PowerPoint with lists of resources and possibly NAMI will send that uh, to you as a follow-up. Uh, thanks so much for being here today and for your interest in voting rights for people who have a mental health diagnosis. And thank you, NAMI. Thanks so much, Barbara. That was just a lot of wonderful information. We have time for a couple of questions and one question has come in. Uh, it says, you had mentioned voting with a felony. Are there any restrictions with certain convictions or sentences that take voting rights away from an individual like permanently? And then sort of a follow on with that, if you have, uh, you know, if you're off paper, what do you have to do to get your voting rights back? Okay, so those are, some very good questions. I'm just gonna bring up right now. Oh, and am I, we're I'm not muted. Of people who have had drug abuse convictions may have been convicted of felonies. So there are a lot of people with co-incurring mental illness and substance use disorders. Yeah. yeah, I think the best thing for someone who is unsure if their voting rights have been discharged or not, have been um, restored or not, is to ask their parole officer because you do want to make sure you are off paper. Now the Department of Corrections does provide people when their voting rights have been restored with a certificate that indicates that. And that's one of the things that we've been having some dialogue. We met recently with um, Secretary Kevin Carr and his staff and have had some really good conversation to make sure that that communication um, is clarified and that people at the same time that they get that information get some guidance on what they need to do to register to vote because just having your voting rights restored isn't gonna be meaningful if you don't know what to do next. So we're continuing to have that dialogue and, and I think they've been really responsive. I do think that there might be um, some um, offenses, treason is one, that I think that might be the case for um, where there may be some long-term restrictions. Uh, I wanna make sure that I give you accurate information so I can, maybe I'll check that while Crystal gives her presentation and just be able to speak to that specifically. But I, I know I have seen some language related to treason. But again, I would encourage people, look at the um, ACLU Wisconsin, uh, materials on voting rights for people with criminal convictions. I think they're excellent and they're really helpful to share with community members who may be grappling with this. You know, the Wisconsin Election Commission, we've talked with them about this and they also have been very responsive. And um, Richard Radecki told me about a call that he received recently from an individual who had committed a felony and who's been out in the community for 30 years. So he was definitely off paper, but he was afraid to vote because if you're a felon and you're not off paper and you vote, it's a felony. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you want to make sure. And, you know, I think we were just all outraged to think of people who are living in fear all these years and unable to fully be a part of our democracy. So I hope we can all work together to provide more education on that issue. And there's one more quick question, I think. Um, there are people who have been committed to psychiatric hospital in chapter 51 who think that they have lost the right to vote or that they can't vote from within the hospital. Can you talk, speak to that? Yes, so thank you for that question. So we actually um, did do some um, voting um, education sessions with the staff um, at uh, state facilities, including Mendota, and Winnebago, and we did a particularly more in-depth session for Mendota. And um, generally individuals, you know, unless they've committed a felony, you know, the, the issue we just talked about, um, but many individuals who are in psychiatric facilities are able to vote, but it can be complicated because um, in 
they are not able to use the address of Mendota or Winnebago as their address for voting purposes. So it has to be their prior address. And sometimes, you know, people have been there for some time, they don't have a prior address. So the election commission joined us for some of those trainings to kind of um, brainstorm on what are the solutions for people in that situation. So if you do have some individual situation, those individuals are welcome to call our hotline or if you're advocating on their behalf, we'll try and work with you to find a solution for them. But I have to say sometimes it, it is difficult. Great. Thank you so much, Barbara, and thank you for this information. Barbara will be around, folks, so if you come up with questions for her, uh, we, we, we'll have another Q&A at the end of the session. And so now I would like to introduce you to our own Crystal Hester, who is the Public Policy and Advocacy Director at NAMI Wisconsin. She works to advocate on state issues and strengthen the agency's grassroots advocacy efforts and provide information and referrals to people who call. So welcome, Crystal. Uh, she has a master's in social work, yes, from George Williams Univ and Aurora University, College of Aurora University. And before joining NAMI Wisconsin, she worked as a graduate intern for the NASW, National Association of Social Workers. And she has also served in the US Peace Corps in Kenya. So she has lived a, a full life. And she's gonna to talk to us about NAMI Wisconsin's public policy priorities and a few do's and don'ts for nonprofits, which all of our affiliates are nonprofits. So Crystal, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Sita. And thank you to Barbara for that wonderful presentation, a lot of really informative information. And I know I always learn a little piece whenever I hear you speak, Barbara. So thank you to you both. Um, so let me just, uh, just hang in here with me and I will share my screen and we'll get all set up here. All right, can folks see this now? Yes, we can. All right. So thank you again, Sita, for the introduction. Um, some of you I've met before, others I have not, but thank you and welcome for joining. Um, again, my name is Crystal Hester, the public advocacy, um, a public, excuse me, public policy and advocacy director. And uh, Barbara did a great job of kind of going over the what and the how of voting. And I want to really take a moment to dive into the why. So why, why does my vote? really matter and what is kind of at stake in this really important election. So we're going to talk, like Sita said, about some of the really important uh, current issues, advocacy issues that NAMI Wisconsin members should be aware of and, and care about. And then we're going to talk a little bit more specific about um, what nonprofits can do, uh, how we can engage in our elections and how we can't. So um, let's just dive into the issues here. And with each of these, I've kind of uh, broken the slides down into a talking point, um, certain ways that we can address this issue, and then a candidate question. So if you're um, communicating with, with uh, your local candidates and you care about this issue, here's just a sampling of what you can say to them. And certainly um, think about how this is affecting you or your family or your community, um, because they want to hear about real constituent issues, right? Um, they they want to know how this is personally affecting um, their constituents. So the first issue that we want to talk about is COVID-19. And if you were able to join us um, in May when we did our virtual action on the square, um, some of this might be familiar to you. And I've certainly updated it with things that have occurred since May. Um, but obviously COVID-19 is, is the big one, right? Um, it's affected people all people, but especially those who are experiencing a mental illness. It's increased isolation, anxiety, depression, but there also have been um, some strides that we've made. And one of those has been telehealth, which um, people have been utilizing. And we've seen folks that maybe wouldn't um, access treatment traditionally 
before COVID-19 and now, now they, have, um, they have access. And uh, whether that reason was due to being isolated or in a rural area, not having transportation, um, having a really hard time getting out of bed and feeling motivated, or if they just um, had that stigma of being seen, you know, entering their mental health facility in the community, uh, telehealth has opened doors for folks. So we wanna eliminate, eliminate any barriers to telehealth by ensuring that health insurance companies cover these services and, and also to expand access to broadband, especially in those rural and underserved parts of our state. Folks still don't have that access. And the other important piece about this, this issue is that we wanna make it, uh, have it remain an option. Um, telehealth is not for everyone. And certainly there are going to be some folks who, who would prefer that face-to-face -face visit, but having it as an option, having choice in the matter is really important. Another thing that has kind of come to the forefront is our need for a 24-7, 365 statewide warm line. And a warm line is kind of a step down from a crisis line, if you will. And it's a number that you can call to get peer support, referrals, resources, or you know, just talk to someone. Sometimes you just need to, to talk. And right now our peer run respites in the state and several others are providing warm line support, but they don't have the resources or the capacity all year round um, to, to operate on a 24 seven basis because they have guests staying with them. So the state has really seen that this is a need. This is something that um, we, we really do need. Um, NAMI Fox Valley uh, has taken the lead on gathering together uh, different stakeholders who might wanna be a part of pushing for this change. So if these issues are important to you, here's some questions that you can ask your candidate. How do you plan to ensure that everyone has access to appropriate mental health services when they need them? And how will you promote the utilization of peer supports in our state? The next issue is access to treatment. Uh, everyone deserves access to quality mental health services when they need them in their own communities. That's really important. And NAMI has long been a supporter of the Medicaid expansion, um, expanding it to 138% of the federal poverty level. We did what's called a partial ex expansion years ago um, to cover 100%, but this would allow for so many more, thousands more people to be able to access mental health services. And it was one of the most important issues that Governor Evers ran his campaign on. And unfortunately there has been, it has been a very partisan issue and we haven't gotten this done, but we'll continue to shout it from the rooftops that uh, we really need this. It's important now more than ever in a health pandemic that people have access to the services they need to take care of their mental health. One of the other issues um, having to do with access is that we have a severe um, shortage of behavioral health professionals in our state, um, either due to uh, them retiring, we're not replacing them fast enough, uh, people aren't going into this, uh, this field, uh, we don't have enough providers that look like us speak our language, we don't have enough in rural areas, people are traveling, really far distances, especially in those northern parts of the state where there might be one or two psychiatrists covering multiple counties. There's long waiting lists to get in to see them. So this is, this is really a public health crisis. So some of the things that would really help in this situation are providing tax incentives for psychiatrists who practice in our state, employment opportunities, for peer specialists. So we're not just talking psychiatrists, but think of the, the larger um, behavioral health workforce. Um, and then loan forgiveness programs um, for these professionals. They're going to school, they're coming out with, with mounds of debt. And so what is really the incentive um, to go into these professions? So some of the questions that you can think of here um, to ask your candidate are, what are some of your approaches to addressing the behavioral health workforce shortage facing our state? We need a, a, a huge package. It's not gonna be one bill that solves everything. And then how will you ensure that everyone gets the help they need when they need it? Our next issue is suicide prevention, another public health crisis that we just aren't doing enough to address. Um, it is a growing but preventable uh, public health crisis. So we need a really comprehensive approach so we can save lives in Wisconsin. One issue NAMI Wisconsin has uh, lobbied for and cared deeply about is what's called the Extreme Risk Protection Order, or ERPO. Um, it goes by a lot of different names. Some of you might have heard, heard of it called red flag legislation or uh, lethal means protection order. 
Essentially, they're all the same. Um, this would allow a family member or a loved one to petition a court to have a firearm temporarily removed from a home when a loved one poses a risk of violence to themselves or others. Uh, this, this year, the Speaker of the Assembly, Representative Robin Voss, formed a uh, suicide prevention task force, and it was made up of a bipartisan membership of from the assembly and they traveled all over the state hearing stories, hearing testimony from folks uh, who were affected in some way or another by suicide. And they heard from experts, doctors, law enforcement and community members and put together a package of um, initiatives that, that would help with this crisis. And unfortunately, Urba was not included in that. And we know that um, access to lethal means is one of the risk factors or suicide and people are, are dying at much higher rates by suicide if they have a firearm that's in their home that they have access to that's not being safely stored. The next um, issue that we've been involved in is um, what's called the SAMHSA's Governor's Challenge to Prevent Suicide Among Service Members, Veterans, and Their Families. And NAMI was invited to um, collaborate and be, uh, be become part of a group of stakeholders who work on behalf of veterans, which is a, a high risk a group um, for suicide. So we've been working on um, awareness, connectedness, education, and lethal means, and um, attended a virtual policy academy um, with folks from all over the country to put together some a, a plan of action of how we were going to, to address, um, address suicide among veterans, and suicide, suicide among service members and their families. There's also many other high risk groups that we work on behalf of, including the LGBTQ community, farmers, youth and law enforcement. And so um, we really need a, a really comprehensive approach so we can help to save lives. So here's a, um, a candidate question that uh, you can pose um, to your candidate. How will you prioritize mental health care before people find themselves in crisis? Um, suicide really is the fatal uh, point of, of serious persistent mental illness. The next issue is youth mental health. Uh, we need to, um, youth need to be able to access appropriate school and community-based mental health services and peer supports during the first signs of mental, emotional, or behavioral challenges. So some of the ways that, that we can help in this area is to provide funding for additional support in and out of the classroom as students, teachers, and parents navigate a global health pandemic and new way of learning. Some students are adjusting really quickly to this, this new curriculum. Others are really struggling. It's hard. And so we need to be there uh, to, to support our communities, our youth, and embrace our teachers and our parents who are, are doing the hardest job they've ever done right now. Um, we also need to ensure adequate access to school-based mental health services and peer support programs for all Wisconsin student in, students in need. Uh, these positions are often cut from, from school budgets, um, but more than ever right now, we, we really need them. So one candidate question that you can ask, or a couple actually, what do you feel are the most dire issues facing our education system today? And what do you feel teachers, students, and parents need to be successful? Our next issue is criminal justice reform. Um, as Barbara mentioned, we know that jails and prisons hold a disproportionate number of people with um, mental illness, and they're at higher safety and health risks than the general, the general population. So what we can do is increase access in jails and prisons to medical care, personal hygiene products, no cost phone calls to family members, and 30-day med prescriptions upon release. So these are some recommendations that NAMI National uh, put out that could really help folks, um, you know, lessen those risks of, of COVID while they're incarcerated. And we've long supported the expansion of the Treatments Alternative and Diversion Program, or TAD. And this is a program that diverts low-risk offenders away from jail and into treatment. Um, this is essentially what people who are experiencing a mental health crisis need. They need treatment, not incarceration. So if this is an issue that you're passionate about that affects you, one question that you can ask is, um, how do you propose we best care for individuals in jails and prisons, especially during COVID-19? Next, uh, we have uh, law enforcement and 
Um, obviously, right now, there's a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of distrust um, amongst our communities um, when it comes to law enforcement, given uh, recent tragedies that have happened. Um, law enforcement are often the first point of contact for people experiencing a mental health crisis. And because of that, they need more training, they need more resources um, to eff effectively and compassionately serve their communities. NAMI Wisconsin is the grant holder of the CIT, the Crisis Intervention uh, Training Grant. And um, I can tell you that as soon as we receive this grant, those funds are gone because officers uh, and agencies, they want, they want this training. They want to feel prepared and have this tool when they're going on a call to someone experiencing a crisis. And we also um, could create regional, uh, regional crisis stabilization centers and reopen Mendota Mental Health in Madison for civil commitments. Law enforcement right now are using a lot of val valuable resources and time to transport people to Winnebago um, during an emergency detention. This is taking them off the streets and away from their communities, um, sometimes for five, six, seven hours at a time. And it, it's, it's also very traumatizing and not a best case scenario for, for that individual that's being transported. And so um, we need to have some better options um, so we can treat people with dignity and respect when they're going through a crisis. So a question that you can ask is, uh, what do you feel are the most important issues facing law enforcement today? And what changes to policing would you make so that people with mental illness are being best served? All right, so just a quick review here. Um, what we want is to eliminate barriers to telehealth and ensure it's covered by health insurance companies, create a 24 seven, 365 statewide warm line, expand Medicaid to 138% of the federal poverty level, develop a package of initiatives that will increase our behavioral health workforce, pass the extreme risk protection order, support um, the initiatives that come out of the governor's challenge um, for service members, veterans, and families, provide additional funding for um, supports in and out of the classroom for students, parents, and teachers, ensure access to school and community-based mental health services, including peer support, increase access in jails and prisons um, to some things that are really gonna help during this pandemic, and then to increase the funding for CIT and have some alternatives for transport. So if, if any of these have struck a chord, I highly encourage you to contact your, your representatives. Um, I just put the website up here so that you are aware of it. If you've ever wondered who, who represents me, visit legis.wi.gov. Um, from there, there's gonna be a little search bar that says find my legislators. It's really important that you put your home, your full home or voting address in there. If you just type in, I live in Waukesha, um, that's not, that's not going to find the result that you want. Um, you really do need to enter every, all the information there. And it's, it's a really easy to navigate uh, website. From there, um, a, a photo and contact information will pop up on your screen. Um, you can click through and read about their bio, um, information about them, such as what um, committee memberships, um, they have and bills they support and oppose. So you can find a lot of information right there. And I highly recommend you become familiar with who represents you. Read their bio. Maybe your kids go, went to the same school. Maybe um, you're a member of the same church or organizations. Um, so those are going to be really important things to create rapport with your representatives. Many folks don't have internet. Um, that's fine. There's a number that you can call. They'd, they'd be happy to, to help you with that. Um, you can also give NAMI Wisconsin a call um, and we can look that up for you. All right, so the next slide is uh, 501c3 do's and don'ts. And um, 501c3, it, it looks just like a bunch of wonky uh, letters and numbers, but it is actually, it is the US Internal Revenue Code, and it's a specific tax category uh, for nonprofit organizations that basically said, we are exempt from uh, federal income tax. Um, but what that code actually says is that um, organizations are pro prohibited from directly or indirectly participating in or intervening in any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for elective public office. And it states that uh, 501c3 organizations 
can conduct voter engagement or connect with candidates on a nonpartisan basis, not on a partisan basis. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those specific do's and don'ts. So um, this, this can be a really delicate situation that NAMI staff members find themselves in. Um, there needs to be that healthy and ethical balance between needing to remain nonpartisan within your offices and also having your own political preferences and views outside in your personal life. So it's just something that we all need to be conscious of and make sure that um, you know, we know which hat we're wearing at which time. So here's a list of do's and don'ts that you can conduct within your, um, or your local affiliates. This is just a partial list that I'm going to go over today. NAMI National does put out a, a um, local affiliate election toolkit every year, which, which is great. Um, that has, goes into further detail and has other do's and don'ts as well. So I highly recommend you take a look at that document. Just make sure that we're doing everything that we can to um, follow the rules and, and go by the book. So some of the do's are um, conducting or promoting voter registration, probably the top thing that, that we do. And, you know, Barbara's great um, presentation as well. Um, you know, this is, this is one of the areas that's really easy for us to just um, get the word out about. NAMI affiliates can host or co-sponsor a nonpartisan candidate forum. So what we mean by that is if you invite a candidate from one party, you must invite a candidate from another party as well. We do this at Action on the Square as well. We always have um, one Republican speaker, uh, one Democrat speaker. We wanna make sure that, that we're keeping everything fair. You can encourage staff to serve as poll workers. Huge need right now due to COVID. If, if you're healthy and you feel safe, um, I know this is, this is something that's a big need. Oops, and my slides keep changing on their own. I apologize, let's go back. Um, we can educate our candidates on our issues. So this isn't um, being partisan. This is just letting them know here's the things that, that NAMI cares about. And we take, um, we take up issues that have to do with people and not parties. We can educate our members on the voting process. Again, uh, Barbara mentioned the My Vote website, very easy to navigate. If someone doesn't have internet, um, if you can help them with that, that's, that's a huge um, need across the state. It has a lot of great information. You can distribute nonpartisan sample ballots, candidate questionnaires, or voter guides. Um, we have a candidate questionnaire that we um, just, just released, just finalized the other day. So look out for that, it'll be coming your way. And then we can talk a little bit about the don'ts. So those are the do's. Uh, what, what can't we do as a NAMI uh, local affiliate? Um, so, so number one, pretty obvious, um, endorse or oppose a candidate. So we can't say I'm NAMI Fox Valley and I'm voting for whoever. Um, make a campaign contribution to a candidate. So that's coming out of, of your pocketbook and not NAMI's. Um, rating candidates on who is the most favorable to their issues or publicize which candidates share the organization's views. So sometimes you might see um, candidate report cards come out. Um, that's something that, that we really stay away from. Um, also letting a candidate use the organization's facilities or resources unless they are made equally available to all candidates. So if somebody wants to use your conference room um, for a political event, um, you have to equally make that available to, to the other candidates. And then finally, um, and the obvious host a partisan candidate forum. So again, just a partial list and I encourage you to take a look at the, um, the full 501c3 do's and don'ts that National has provided for us. So why does all this matter to NAMI members? A um, lot of in great information today, but why, why do we care so much? Why are we taking so much time um, into learning all this? And the really simple answer that I can give is that our elected officials are making decisions every day that impact peers, families, service members, and the systems in which we rely on to live healthy, productive lives every single day. And this is from the local level all the way up to the presidential seat. So um, a lot of times people just think about uh, uh, federal politics, uh, state politics, mm -hmm. but think about the person that's sitting on your child's school board. Who is down there um, working as a judge at the courthouse? Who is in, in those um, county buildings making decisions that affect you? 
um, it's really important and we need to have our voices elevated so they know what's important uh, for people who are living with mental illness and their families. Um, so kind of piggybacking off of that, that's why it's so important to vote in every election, not just the presidential race. Um, I often say politics happen close to home. Um, so these are, these are some of the people that are gonna make decisions that will have probably the most notable impacts um, on your community, on your family. And if I haven't given you enough reasons, Barbara hasn't given you enough reasons to vote. Um, if, you, if you are not voting for yourself, do it for the millions of Americans who really rely on that vote. Um, there's gonna be decisions made that impact their lives and we want everyone to live a healthy and productive life. So one thing that you can do um, that would be really helpful, encourage and challenge everyone on this call today is to take the, the pledge to vote for mental health at NAMI.org. Um, this is something they put out um, every year uh, or every election, to, um, just so that you can spread the word. It's just a really simple thing that you can do to let your family and friends know, I care about these issues and this is why I'm voting. And finally, look out for our legislative priority survey. Um, it's going to be coming your way soon. And um, basically what this is before the start of each um, legislative session, NAMI Wisconsin puts out a survey to all of its members and we are a grassroots organization, which means that our issues come from you. And so we wanna hear from you. We wanna know what's important. Everything that I've gone over today has come from our members and we wanna know what's going on in our communities uh, so that we, you can help guide our advocacy efforts over the next couple of years. So look out for that. Um, it takes you probably five minutes to fill out and um, give us some feedback about what you wanna see in the next, um, the next couple of years. So with that, that wraps up my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. If there's something that you think of that uh, after this session is over, here's my contact information. That's what I'm here for is to support you in um, your local advocacy efforts. And with that, I'm going to ha hand it back to Sita, but thank you so much for allowing me to give this presentation. And I thank you for your democracy, your participation in our democracy this election season. Thank you. Thanks so much, Crystal. That was a lot of great information. And uh, the legislative survey is not just for affiliate leaders, right? That's for members. Correct. As well. Correct. So send it out far and wide and you will be sending it out far and wide, but any kind of encouragement we can get from affiliate leaders would be great. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions. One question is, how do I know if the people I'm voting for support mental health initiatives, particularly NAMI's priorities? Yeah, well, I would say the really simple answer is to, to contact them and ask them. Um, go on to their website. Um, they will have their platform on where they stand on certain issues and read up about them. Sometimes I get my ballot in the mail. I usually vote um, absentee and there's going to be someone on there that I've never heard of their name. Maybe they're, they're not getting a lot of media attention. And I do research before I vote in every election. Um, so I'll go on their website and take a look and um, read their bio, read you know the sort of things that they're involved with and uh, make your decision up for yourself. Yeah, and then also particularly at the county level, you can uh, you know email them and or call them and begin developing a relationship because the relationship is what will carry you through. You know, after they're elected, they'll remember, oh, that person from NAMI called me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then we had a request for that wonderful slide that you had about the do's and don'ts for uh, 501c3 election participation. How can affiliates get that information? in order to share with their board and their volunteers, et cetera. Sure, um, I believe our plan was, was um, to send this out in some capacity. Um, it is also the full document is located on uh, nami.org. And I can certainly do an email blast as well to all affiliate leaders um, who might have missed that. Um, Hannah w uh, Wesolowski at NAMI National sends out a lot of great information if you don't get her, um, her e-alerts from National. So um, she might be another one to, to sign up for to make sure that um, um, you're getting, you're getting um, all that great information that National sends out. That's great, yeah. And I think we can, let's stop sharing screen here and get everybody on the line. Okay. And just see, let's have a chat amongst ourselves and anybody who feels so led, please uh, show us your face and unmute. And if you have questions or thoughts 
about election engagement. I know Barbara had some um, news for us on the felon question, felon voting question, right? Well, actually on uh, news on another question, and this was before we all got on the call, there were uh, a question from some of the Madison folks about the democracy in the park and uh, about the ballot. So I did hear back from the election commission and their response was, uh, there have been no challenges filed to any of the ballots collected during the two democracy in the park events. We do not see any reason why there would be I would be reluctant to encourage voters to spoil legally cast ballots provided they return them with all of the required information. So that is the word from the election commission. At so the democracy in the park is a go, basically, is what you're yeah. saying. They are yeah. saying at this time there have not been any challenges filed and they don't see any reason why there would be. They seem mm -hmm. to feel that it was legitimately ballots were legitimately cast so um okay. yes and in terms of the other issue people had uh there had been a question and, and i did not hear back yet from the commission because i just wanted to run it by them but just you know checking from the resources that we have that an individual can vote if they're not currently in jail or prison or on probation parole or extended supervision for a felony uh, or for any treason or bribery conviction. And in some cases, people may be able to vote when they are in jail, depending on the offense and depending on whether their community, whether they're able to get the support they need to do that. Okay, that's great. And then there are questions about, uh, so we've got millions of absentee ballots coming in. Will there be enough staff in the polling places to count these within the time limit? Do you have, you, do you have any <laughs> notion about that? <laughs> that? <laughs> well, I, I know that a lot of work and planning has gone into that. And it, again, I guess because I'm in Milwaukee and it's the largest um, city in the state, I hear a lot about it. And I know they, they are very confident that they will have enough people at the central count location to count all of the ballots. Um, they, they may be going for a very long time and it'll be a, a long night. Uh, there also is still litigation, you know, the cases with the U.S. Supreme Court. So there is a possibility that the timeline for counting and um, recognizing absentee ballots will be extended. They just did that in another state. Um, I think it was Pennsylvania. So it's possible that would happen in Wisconsin. And I would just say that our municipal clerks who work so hard, they have tried for years to have the legislature it, change the process because they could be counting absentee ballots mm -hmm. earlier, and then we wouldn't have this gridlock, uh, you know, on election day and night. But the legislature did not bring that bill up for a hearing, unfortunately. And as you know, they've been out of session for some period of time. Oh, yeah. And if I can add to that too, Barbara, and our, our um, CIT director, Helen, is chiming in too that she um, works the polls and said um, the last election, April, they were up until 2 a.m. <laughs> so um, definitely many, uh, many poll workers will be doing that again in November. Um, a week or so ago, I sat in on a, a NAMI National held a town hall on um, elections and what this looks like for NAMI members. And one of the takeaways um, that I, that I saw was that, you know, it's really important. We, we play a role in providing support to people with mental illness and their families. And there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety. If you're someone that lives with a, a mental illness, that's just been heightened and exasperated over the, the last year, really. Um, so it's really important that we let our members know that this is not an election like usual. There is so much up for grabs, so much at stake and, um, for those of you who participate in the elections every um, every time they come around and you stay up until midnight until you can't keep your eyes open anymore, um, it, it just know that this is this is going to be it's going to be a long night. And if we have those really clear expectations and we understand those, it makes it easier for people to cope. It makes it people easier for us to have some patience, and that's going to be really key this election. And I just want to say thank you to your uh, folks on the call who are acting as poll workers and all of our community members, I, it's always a very important service, but especially now when some of the people who've traditionally acted in this role aren't, aren't able to do so because of the health um, 
issues and um, we we rely on those poll workers and they, they have a difficult job to do. So thank you. And if you know others who are interested, they're still, uh, as of last count, I think there were 50 Wisconsin communities where they were still short on poll workers. So there is a need. People can only be a poll worker though in the county where they live. There was an opportunity to broaden that and then that was struck down by some recent litigation. So it, it's been a very confusing environment. Is there an easy way to find out where poll workers are needed or not needed? Um, I could follow up and send a list. There was a recent um, document from the election commission that, that shared that information. Maybe if we're on the call for a few more minutes, I'll even find it now, we'll see. <laughs> okay, that's great. Barbara, was that a recent change on, because I know I heard on NPR just last week or two weeks ago that you could volunteer to do simple task in a county that you weren't registered in, like help make sure it's clean or that um, like simple tasks that don't have to do with being around the ballot. So that was struck down that you could know you could not do that. That is a good question. My understanding is that the restriction was specific to serving as a poll worker, that that was narrowed so that people could only be a poll worker in their, their county of origin. So to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't apply to, you know, doing those other tasks that you mentioned. Um, okay. That's a good question. I, I it, was, it was this, I think it was the executive director to the myvote dot the website that we've all been referencing. <laughs> she was on NPR and she was saying you can do things like, you know, stand there and hand squirt guns out and make sure people have on mask or whatever those, you know, kind of outside of the, the location. But I don't know if that's still true or not uh, based on what you're saying, so. Yeah, no, I, I was only speaking about poll workers. So not to have any confusion, that might've been Megan Wolf that you're talking about, who's the director for the Wisconsin Elections Commission. So if I do find any further guidance on that, I can certainly send it over to, to NAMI to share with you all. That's great. And then Helen also says election counts also count as open meetings. So if you're up for it, you can just come and watch and cheer people on though. Mm -hmm. you know, with social distancing, that may or may not be a good idea this yeah, year. They're, they're very, they're very um, specific restrictions on observers. Just yeah. so people know, that's always the case. And in this year, it's going to be very limited. So um, my understanding is that at most polling places, they're going to be, um, like in the city of Milwaukee, I talked with them recently, they're going to be limited to two, one from each party. And they may have, at some of the larger polling places, the ability to do more. And people are just going to be in there for a limited period of time, rotated in and out. It's not, we usually do, um, audits of polling places, accessibility audits on election day all over the state, Disability Rights Wisconsin does that. But again, because of the pandemic, you know, that's not being, that's not happening, both because of the health issues and also because of the chaos that may be going on uh, on election day. And not to further add to that. And, you know, there's a lot of concerns right now about security as well and in voter intimidation. Right. So that's a, right big focus too. Well, does anybody have any more questions before we go to our poll? Do stick around. Our poll only takes a minute. All right. Well, then hearing none, here comes the poll. Go ahead, everybody. This is your first chance to vote, or maybe you already voted early. I voted early, but I'm going to take this poll here. All right, so I thank you so much, Barbara and Crystal, for this really worthwhile information. And again, oh, oh it looks like, yep, yeah, we got some undecided, but mostly 80% said, yep, it was helpful. So that's great. <laughs> thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, here comes another poll question. Did you learn something new from this session? So we'll wait for a moment and then I'll open the envelope. But in the meantime, I'm thanking Barbara and I'm thanking Crystal. And I particularly thank um, Disability Rights Wisconsin because you do so much for people with mental health 
challenges, but you know, disabilities in general and, and elders. So we're really grateful to you. Yep, everybody learned something new. That's wonderful. So I'm wondering if we have, uh, let's hang out for a minute and we'll see if we have another poll question. Maybe that's it. Is that it, Stacy, or do you have another poll question coming up? And I would like to thank all of you who work on the in the at the grassroots. You um, make our grassroots go. You know, you make our grassroots stronger. And and I know, you know, living with my own family situation, I felt weak. But when I came to NAMI, I realized that we're all in this together and it helped me feel strong. So 100% of everybody learned something new from this session. Great, that's good news. And if there's anyone who's undecided about anything to do with elections or voting or issues, um, again, you have my contact information and I'd love to help sway you um, over the fence. So please don't be a stranger. And uh, Barbara has just put uh, communication from WC about poll, WEC about poll workers. So you can scoop that out of the chat if you're, if you're curious. So with that, everyone, we'll bid you good afternoon and be well, stay safe, and keep doing good work and keep in touch. Thank you.